you know, I, I just like the young adults there are wearing masks and then the teachers are wearing masks. I've seen this clearly evident as well on the main undergraduate campus at Texas Tech. I've seen it here at the Health Sciences Center that everybody is wearing masks. That's what's stopping this virus. That's what's slowing it down so that we can maintain and, and have the ability to open up. One other quick subject I wanna to talk to you about is vaccinations. It is evident also that nationwide, because we were so um, nervous about being out and we were at stay home orders, that our vaccination rate has dropped off. I know that the Health Sciences Center and I know that many physicians offices and other healthcare providers offices are safe places to go and we must make sure that you get your vaccinations up to date. It's okay that we've had a delay of two or three months. We must, however, move back into our normal vaccination phases and get everybody up to date. Make sure that your child's vaccinations are up to date. Make sure that if you uh, need a pneumococcal vaccine or a shingles vaccine or the flu vaccine, which uh, most of the physician's offices are gonna have their flu vaccine by September, that you get your vaccines back up to date. That will help us delineate if you do get sick, that if you've had your vaccines uh, and that, that if you do get sick, it helps us delineate whether it's uh, something else or COVID. Again, make sure that you maintain your social distancing, maintain your mask wearing and washing your hands. We're doing a great job. Our numbers are decreasing. Everybody should pat yourself on the back, but don't take it for granted. It's not a time to have pool parties or yard parties yet. That's all that I have to say today. I want to introduce to you Dr. Kathy Rollo, the Lubbock Independent Super Lubbock Independent School District Superintendent. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Cook. Our new school year started on Monday and it was so wonderful to see our students and staff after five long months. I had the opportunity to visit many of our campuses over the last two and a half days and it has been so wonderful to see so many happy students, teachers, and parents. Um, our protocols for student drop-off and pickup have worked very well, as well as our lunch protocols and our bus transportation protocols. Um, we've made a few adjustments, but things have been working very, very smoothly. I am extremely proud of our students and adults in our buildings because we have been wearing masks and practicing social distancing and everyone has done their part to go to school safely. Um, this situation has given us the opportunity to learn how to adapt and adjust and do things differently to meet the needs of our families. We're excited to offer a virtual school option and about 8,000 of our students are participating in that. That's about 30% of our overall student population. And we've had very positive feedback and stories from students interacting with teachers online. Um, we are very, very excited and, and um, appreciative of the Lubbock Health Department and um, Catherine Wells and the work that she has done to help us develop our protocols over the summer and um, the collaboration she is providing with us um, every single day. So Catherine, we appreciate you very much. Um, we're excited to be back in school. This is where our students thrive and we're just grateful to have the opportunity to start this school year off safely. That's all I have. I'll turn it over to my colleague and friend, Dr. Michelle McCord, the Superintendent of Friendship ISD. Thank you, Dr. Rollo. Um, we, much like uh, Dr. Rollo mentioned, uh, that was, I think the happiest day I've had in 2020 was on August the 17th, when we got to welcome back our students and our staff. And um, we have about, 85% of our students have chosen face-to-face -face learning, and we have about 15% uh, participating virtually. And um, actually, that percentage has changed a little bit. So before the first day of school, we were anticipating about 17% of our students participating virtually. But on the first day of school, many of the parents of virtual learners they said, hey, can we change our minds? Um, we see all these kiddos going to school and, 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 and we think we're ready. 
to come face to face. And absolutely, we said yes. We welcomed them with open arms. And so we see about 15% of our kids still participating virtually. That's going really well. Um, and of course, there are still a few hiccups here and there, but overall, things are going great. Um, and I was so happy to report and so proud of our students and our families and our staff. We did not have one student refuse to wear a mask in grade fourth grade or up, which is um, at the grade level in which we require you to wear a mask. Not one uh, refused. Uh, great compliance. And um, then we also, we have had uh, great support from our community. Again, I can't uh, say enough how much we, uh, we are just thankful for the support of our community, our physicians and the health department. Um, the folks at Friendship ISD, we burn up the phone lines um, calling uh, the health department. They're a great resource for us. And um, we are happy to be in our third day of this safe return for our students and our staff. Uh, but we know this is an ongoing uh, process. It's an evolving process. And we don't make these decisions alone. Um, we collaborate together. And also, it's important for us um, to hear your feedback as our parents and our community members. So just because school has started doesn't mean that we've all got it figured out. We are off to a great start and I just couldn't be more grateful um, for your support. At this time, I'm gonna turn it over to our mayor, uh, Mr. Dan Pope. Good morning, thanks Michelle. Kathy, we appreciate you guys. We're in good hands with our school superintendents. We, we would have invited Keith Bryant from Lubbock Cooper to join us today, but today's day one for them. And we felt like he probably had very important things to do in their schools. So I wanna start this morning by sharing a little data as we do every week. So bear with me while I share my screen. Okay, uh, so let's start with positivity rate. This is our 14 day rolling average. Uh, we, uh, we, we like the way this is going. You'll recall that um, uh, a month or six weeks ago, this number was in the 16 to 17% range. Uh, we still would like to get it back down to uh, 6%. That's where we'd, we would like to get. Uh, we've got a way to go, but we're about, uh, we're under 10 for the first two week period, I guess, in, in, uh, uh, in, in a couple of months. And we like the, the direction we're going. Remember that's number of tests, uh, the number of positives over, over the total number of tests divided by the total number of tests. Hospitalization, also a good trend, um, down significantly week over week. Um, a few, a, a little bump yesterday, which is okay. I think I look particularly at the orange part of the line, and that is the uh, ICU beds. And a week ago, we were at 49. Today, we're at 29. We know that will change some, uh, but uh, a, a good trend. Hospitals remain strong. Uh, just a slide to show you our school-age uh, kids, uh, uh, more than, more than uh, two out of three of these cases um, are uh, actually very close to three out of four of these cases are uh, re fully recovered and we have about 137 active cases. This is our case count by by age over the last 14 days. You can see that the bulk of our cases are in the 20 to 49 year uh, um, age groups. Uh, finally, uh, just a little pre-release, uh, our Spanish language COVID-19 dashboards will become live this afternoon. These are some screenshots, uh, and when we update our slides uh, for today's data, you'll be able to see these. Uh, it's the same data you can see on the English language dashboard, and here are a few examples of that. So uh, we promised that, and it is now going to be available. Let me uh, uh, end up. Okay, um, just a few brief comments. Uh, first of all, uh, we, we, 
we grieve with with uh, the with the loved ones or with the families of folks who have uh, lost uh, family members and friends, coworkers, neighbors. Um, we've had more deaths this week, and it's 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 important that that you know that we we uh, we continue to lift you up in our thoughts and our prayers. We also know that many of our families have been impacted, and we don't ever lose sight of the lost jobs and the businesses that are um, and have failed or are in trouble. And so many of our efforts are to try to put you back in a good spot. We are making progress. We're now uh, um, six solid weeks into the uh, uh, face covering uh, requirement in the state of Texas. And you can see that uh, it, it has been positive. Uh, we know what slows the spread, as as Dr. Cook and Catherine talked about. We just need to make sure that we do it. We are in a good spot today uh, for reopening, but we're in the first quarter of a of a of a four quarter football game. Um, we can't expect that we've won. In fact, we need to expect the unexpected. Activity is increasing in our community. Our schools have reopened this week. Uh, we've welcomed more than 25,000 students back to Texas Tech and Lubbock Christian and Wayland and South Plains College and from all over the country as well as the state. We will see more activity. Uh, we can slow the spread though. We know how to do it. And I remind you that um, face coverings, hand washing, physical distancing, Common sense matters. I think we are proving that we can safely and sensibly reopen our economy. We had a chance to, some of us had a chance to meet with Senator Cornyn yesterday when he was in town, and we talked quite a bit about how we reestablish a, a cadence that's a, a life that we recognize and how we do that safely. And that continues to be the stack of mail that we're going to work on every day. So um, until next week, um, thank you for tuning in and I'll kick it to you, Lacey. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Now we will open it up for media questions. We'll ask our panelists all to turn on their videos and microphones. And today's media question order is the Avalanche Journal, KLBK, Fox 34, the Daily Torridor, Latino Lubbock, KMAC, El Editor, Telemundo, KCBD, and Texas Tech Public Media. So today we'll start with Matt Dotre with the Avalanche Journal. Good morning, everyone. Um, I don't see anything about schools on the city's uh, COVID-19 dashboard. So I guess for like for informational purposes, is the city keeping track of the positive cases in schools? like community spread, um, and will, will, will that information be made public? Catherine, you wanna, you wanna start with that one? Yeah, um, so every case, uh, regardless if it's a LASD student or a Texas Tech student is reportable to the health department. So we do have um, information on those cases um, and we communicate between our school districts um, specific schools and the health department on what needs to happen um, if there's a positive case in the community. Um, at this time, there are no plans to put that information out publicly. We do offer the um, age breakdowns on that dashboard. Okay. Will parents be notified? Will, will parents who have students at the schools be notified? Yes, and I'll let Dr. Rollo. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so if there is a positive case, and really I should say when, because we have protocols in place expecting that to happen, um, when there is a positive case, every parent and every staff member in a, a, a campus will be notified of a low risk of exposure. Those um, students, after we do contact tracing, after we know if there has been a close contact with that positive case, we will make individual phone calls to those folks. So yes, everyone in the school will be notified if there's a positive case. 
Okay. Have there been any positive cases yet? I know it's only day two or day three. I know. <laughs> it's day three. So. <laughs> Um, have there been any positive cases in schools? Uh, we have notification today that yes, we do have one. So those parents will be notified. The friendship, um, thankfully, so far we have not had a positive case. But again, just as Dr. Rolo mentioned, we know that there that that's going to happen. I mean, we've we've got uh, lots of kiddos and and lots of uh, staff. But we also have um, done lots of planning and uh, coordinate with the health department. And so we have our processes in place of how to communicate, with whom to communicate, when to communicate. And so we feel prepared. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Matt. And now we have Terry Furman with KLBK. Good morning, everyone. Um, my question really is this, at what point, as far as cases, because we know that they're going to happen, both Texas Tech, South Plains College, everybody's going to see them, especially you know our younger kids in middle school and high school. What is the point where we decide, okay, it's safer if we shut down and everybody goes virtual for a while? Terry, um, I can speak for Lubbock ISD. Um, we are not planning on closing down entire schools at any point. Um, we really believe when we have positive cases, if we follow our protocols and if we are doing those things, we know um, that Dr. Cook talked about earlier, wearing masks and social distancing, we know we can reduce the spread and mitigate the spread of this virus. So um, we don't have any intention of full-scale closures. Um, Terry, I would just echo what Dr. Rolo has said. Um, uh, you mentioned specifically middle school and high school, and all of those students are wearing masks, and all of the staff is wearing masks. And um, so we know that that mitigates, um, you know, the spread. And so uh, we don't have a threshold. If you're looking for a specific number or percentage uh, we don't have that. And, and like we've done for the past five months, we're going to not make a decision in isolation. Our decisions are based on input from our parents, uh, community, uh, for sure the health department, but we don't have a plan like when we get to a certain place that that triggers a closure. Okay, Dr. McCordwell, I've got you. My follow-up question is this. Will there be as much grace extended to families that are doing virtual learning as everybody has given the schools? And, and that's pretty much the word of the year. Um, because I know we're at home doing virtual learning for friendship and it's extremely frustrating. What do you mean by grace extended? Um, let's see things that don't work kids are behind it's only day three and we're already behind because links don't work videos don't work logins don't work and it's been extremely frustrating to to get on because it, it's not the same as it was back in the spring sure well terry first of all i would say this is that um if it sounds like you have a specific personal experience. And in that, I would say, you know, please reach out to me, please reach out to the campus. And I know you've probably done that, but I'm certainly happy to visit with you offline about your personal experience. But with regard to generally speaking, of course, we understand that virtual learning is not at all like it was last spring. It was very flexible. We didn't have the same grading policies. You know, it was just very much um, trying to approach things um, sometimes a day at a time, sometimes a minute at a time. So I can uh, promise you that of course, we're going to work with every parent and every student and every child to help them. Uh, and yes, we want to extend that same grace that was extended to us last spring. And then again, related to your own personal issue, uh, please reach out to me or anyone else? It's not just me, it's several families that I've talked to, but yes, ma'am, thank you. Okay, perfect. And I'll just add to that, this is the first time in history that school districts have stood up to 
um, entirely different modes of learning. And so, um, yes, we've had some hiccups as well in Lubbock ISD, but our help desk and our um, technology team and our virtual school teachers are, are working through those. And so um, we appreciate grace extended to us too, as we um, work through a few kinks, but um, know that we are doing the very best we can to make sure that, that our virtual students have a high quality learning experience. Excellent. Thank you. Now we go to Blair Sable with Fox 34. Hi all, good morning. Uh, so my questions are also going to be uh, focused on the school districts going back to in-person learning. And uh, Kathy, it was, it was great to see you the other day on the first day of school. Uh, but this, this question will be for both you and uh, Dr. McCord. Um, and you mentioned this, you touched upon this a little bit in um, what you were saying a few minutes ago. Uh, you said there were some adjustments that you guys had to make in the first couple of days of school. Do you mind going into detail about uh, what those adjustments were for both you and Dr. McCord? Um, I can share a couple of examples, um, just, and these are going to be very specific to campuses, but I know at one campus, um, they had two grade levels going in and out of one door um, for drop off and pick up. And so I know on day two, they made an adjustment and had one of the grade levels move to another door. So those are the, the types of, of adjustments that our individual principals are making and they're just doing that. Sometimes it's hard to know what to expect until you live through it. And so as they have started school, they have seen where some, um, some congestion may be that they could make an adjustment to help alleviate that. So that's one example. Um, another one would be um, cafeterias and um, making some slight adjustment on lunch times to um, do a better job of social distancing. So those are just two examples that come to mind right away. Um, I, would, I would provide just a couple of specific examples too. Um, one is that uh, we had one particular campus that we were seeing uh, really the, the morning drop off went well, but the afternoon pickup um, it, it really, it just took too long. And so uh, it was an elementary campus and, it, and at elementaries, as you know, that has to be a, that's a highly orchestrated event, both drop off and pick up because you don't just let the students leave. You, um, you have walkers, you have bus riders and you have parent pickup. And so I think we had a situation at one of our campuses, um, the one I'm specifically thinking of, that the, the whole pickup in the afternoon, it just took too long. And, um, you know, our parents were, were, uh, were kind to us as always, but um, we did hear some concerns about, you know, we've got to speed up this process a little bit because like if you're a walker, um, they were having to, to wait and it was a nice enough day yesterday, but if it was really cold or really rainy or whatever, that, that wouldn't have worked. Um, and then another, um, situation that we're dealing with is um, that we have kids who are switching from virtual to face-to-face -face, and so we're having to level out staffing having to do some switching around which that that happens sometimes um, but this year kind of like Kathy mentioned it's well, there's going to be a little bit more switching around than normal because in the past years as a fast growth district we're accustomed to kids entering the school system every day. Um, but now we have it where we're kind of standing up two separate um, systems, both virtual and face-to-face. -face. And so just leveling out classes, uh, it's great to see uh, kiddos come in, but we probably are gonna need to add some staff. Uh, we had some classrooms that had um, a few too many kiddos in there. So we're looking at those numbers each day. Thank you for that. Thank you for going into detail. Uh, and my follow-up question uh, has to do with, of course, we have those contingency plans in place, not if, but when there are cases identified in the school districts. Um, so uh, substitutes, uh, do you both believe that you have enough backup staff to keep the classrooms going? Are our teachers expected to continue teaching virtually if they have to quarantine, if they're in close contact? Uh, do you have an idea of how that's that's going to work? So, so I I can start um, with that question. Is um, thankfully yes, we do have plenty of substitute teachers. Um, just a quick shout out to the great community in which we live. I've had several people um, that have 
said, hey, do you need help with substitute teaching? Um, I, if you get short on the list, we've had some of our own parents, just some of our uh, upstanding citizens that have said, hey, if you need my help, uh, we can, we don't necessarily, you know, need to substitute or not looking for the financial part of it, but we just want to help. And so then also with your question with regard to, are teachers going to be required to teach from home if, for example, they get quarantined? And things change every minute, but our plan right of this moment is that we feel like we have enough staff and enough substitutes that if a teacher needs to quarantine, that she will not be required to teach her students from home. So very similarly to um, Friendship ISD, Lubbock ISD does have um, a lengthy list of substitute teachers. Of course, if you're interested, we would love to add some more to our list, um, but we are confident right now that we can meet the needs. Um, a little different, um, Lubbock ISD is giving the teacher the option if that teacher does need a quarantine and wants to continue to teach from home, we are absolutely allowing them to do that, but that is going to be an option left to the teacher. And we just decided to do that um, because we felt like that would keep instruction moving forward um, in a high quality manner. But again, it is gonna be completely up to the teacher to make that decision. Thank you all. Okay, thank you, Blair. In, in an effort to save some time, um, if you have a question for the schools and both superintendents would like to jump in on that same question, that's great. Let's not just ask them both the same question. So next we go to Adon Rubio with the Daily Toreador. Hello, everyone. Um, my first question is in regards to mass gatherings, specifically those in or around the Texas Tech campus. I was just wondering what plans are in place to enforce any rules or guidelines regarding gatherings as the fall semester is about to begin for colleges. Yeah, I'll take that one to Don. Thanks for your question. Um, we, first and foremost, uh, we still are uh, receiving a number of uh, large group plans. Remember that the governor's order restricts uh, gatherings um, outdoor gatherings above, above 10 people you need you need to have approval from if you're in the city from the from the mayor's office and so uh, you go to our, our Lubbock safe website if you've got a, an event between 10 and 49 people and you self uh, certify your event let us know when it's going to be go through the questions we if you have if you need information we can help you if it's more it's going to be 50 or more then we ask you to uh, bring us a written plan for a safety plan for your event. And we're still having, uh, I think, very good compliance around that. So that's first. Second, certainly there will be house parties and the like. Um, we're going to address those on a one-off basis. We want neighbors to call us. Um, we have no trouble getting people to pick up the phone and call the non-emergency line at Lubbock PD. That's the best number to call for one of those situations. Uh, and then we will uh, respond and, and, uh, uh, enforce the, uh, the the laws that are in place. Um, uh, so we were used to doing that. Um, I, I don't think it would surprise you, Adon, that uh, this time of year we have a, uh, a number of those kind of opportunities to respond to. We're social, uh, social beings by nature. Uh, we just have to go about things differently. All right. Well, I guess uh, just for another question, I was wondering, are there any efforts with the City of Lubbock Health Department to uh, aid in contact tracing on the Texas Tech campus? Uh, yes, we've actually, um, we've entered into an agreement with Texas Tech where they're going to be um, actually supporting us as the health department um, to assist with that contact tracing. Um, but there is the backup of um, health department staff. We have um, liaisons assigned. Um, to work directly with Texas Tech. Um, they're going to be doing the contact tracing really on behalf of the health department because it's our um, role and that's our legal responsibility to follow up on those um, contacts. All right. Thank you both. Thanks, Adon. Thank you, Adon. Now we have Christy Martinez Garcia with Latino Lubbock. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for your time. 
Um, Kathy, I wanted to thank you again for the other day. It was a great interview. But in lieu of that interview, we've had many parents, staff, and teachers from all backgrounds reach out to us. Of course, the children in class and virtually are glad to start the new year. I know I was happy for them. <laughs> However, Kathy, we've had several reports from these parents and some teachers and have heard of administrators who have contracted COVID-19 and who were told not to make it public and that there were several cases during summer school, even though I think we were told that there were none. As you know, it would be unethical for us, me as a media person to turn a blind eye. So has this been a secret and what schools now have cases and are they teachers or students? So Christy, as far as summer school is concerned, um, we had one teaching assistant that tested positive, but that was all for summer school. As far as telling people to keep the secret, that's absolutely not our protocol at all. Um, now, we are not sharing that because of HIPAA violation, but um, as far as us telling them to, to not share that, that's not the case at all. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. And I did speak on your behalf and did ask them to refer to call you, but let's revisit virtual learning. I know Terry talked about it. We've had many parents that believe that, quote, the school district, LISD, is trying to set them up for failure, end quote, and have not been as supportive or have not communicated or followed up with them. We know that parents are being asked to be flexible as well as patient, and I am encouraging that and on your side, but as Terry uh, mentioned, even LSD, there seems to be issues getting onto Google Classroom via their Chrome tablets, but some have been able to access via a, a mobile phone, which is impossible to learn. And many are complaining that there are not enough virtual teachers. They've not received proper links to their Google Hangouts. And when they message, they're not getting a response. Many parents also did not get instructions until Thursday and Friday. That said, many of the virtual learners are asking for an online orientation and for more virtual teachers. What say you, and are you proactively preparing in case you have to return to virtual learning? So yes, Christy, and I, as I stated earlier, we did have some hiccups, um, and I know that, that districts around the state that are starting virtually, you know, it's not, it, we are setting up two entirely separate um, school systems and we have not done that before. So we did have some hiccups. We did have a virtual open house last Thursday that parents were invited to attend. Um, we are getting information out to parents. The first two days um, were a little bit bumpy with some of those links and our school volume of calls was um, huge. And so we apologize if we didn't get back to someone, someone immediately, but I promise we are getting back to anyone who has left us a message and needs help. Kathy, would you consider redoing that virtual um, orientation because of the simple fact that they didn't get the information until Thursday and Friday? Of course, we have a coordinator of our virtual school and I will ask her if she can share that, absolutely. Hey, we have you in our prayers. Thank you for, for what you guys are doing. We understand. Thanks. Thank Thanks, you. Christy. Thanks, Christy. Okay. Thank you, Christy. Now we have Matt Stell with KMAC News. Thank you so much, Lacey. Uh, my first question, really my only question is this. Um, I grew up in Dallas. I had the privilege of going to the state fair. So when I moved to Lubbock and saw there was a South Plains fair, I was so thankful for that. <laughs> it's a little bit of home. My question is, uh, what we've been told is that the South Plains fair is still expected to go on in a little over a month. Mayor Pope, have they got the okay from you? And kind of how is that going to go? I'm assuming the city's been in contact and been constant communication with them on how the fair is going to go. And we just kind of want an update from the city if they've got the green light. Yeah, so Matthew, great question. I missed the state fair. We should we should try to bring Big Tex out here this year, you know. We, we get, <laughs> I'm sure he's going to miss the fall. Um, We've had a number of discussions with the South Plains Fair for, I guess, now for the last 60 days. Um, I, uh, their plan has continu continued to evolve. We are supportive of them having the fair. In fact, we were actually very impressed by their plan. They're not going to do their concerts. Um, they're going to limit uh, what goes on inside buildings. In fact, they've uh, 
cut and I don't have all those details in front of me. By the time we talk next week, maybe I can get some of that. I may invite uh, Councilman Maskell to come on because it's been a more of a, a Lubbock safe kind of discussion. Uh, but they're going to do things very differently. And I, we think they can safely uh, have the fair. And I, I, I'll uh, commit to you that next week um, I'll provide a little more information. And I would imagine you'll start to see that information from the South Plains Fair. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Good to talk to you. You too. Okay. Thank you, Matt. And now we have Olga Aguero with El Editor. Hello, everybody. Good to see the, uh, the superintendents. Wish they would have been with us a little earlier than day three, but we still appreciate your attendance. Uh, I'd like to put out our condolences on behalf of El Editor newspaper and our staff to all those people that have passed away due to the COVID uh, epidemic. Um, Mayor, sir, you say that, that you would like to have the percentage to be 6%. And I know you're probably saying, Olga's constantly on this, but it's a very serious percentage and we would all love to get down to that percentage. With that being said, how can you continue putting out more efforts and letting people know the importance of wearing a mask and actually taking seriously the social distancing and maybe being hesitant of having large gatherings such as Cooking Garage did for the third time, having a concert. And this is their third concert. And there's people over 200, 300 people out there in the parking lot. Events like this will not support numbers that we are expecting to see from our schools. So as a mayor, I mean, what else can we do? Well, it's a good question, Olga. And like you, I get um, frustrated by people's, um, some decisions that are made. Uh, Cook's Garage is not in the city. Um, we have talked to the, the, the county judge about Cook's, uh, about, that, about the efforts out there because we get lots of phone calls about it. Um, but I think more importantly, our messaging needs to, uh, to be uh, consistent. We'll refresh it. You'll see different people uh, doing different videos, different faces, different, some they'll recognize, some you won't, uh, different ages, certainly uh, different, uh, different parts, all different parts of our community. And we'll continue to do that. Uh, we, we are not going to uh, be silent and we're not going to go away. And uh, I promise you, we will stay the course. Um, and I, if there's nothing um, that I can promise you, it, uh, that's something I can. And, and we will be, um, uh, we'll be consistent, we'll be disciplined, we'll continue to tell the story. Uh, it'll change some, but it won't change when it comes to cover your face, wash your hands, keep your distance, use your head. Um, and we'll, that's what we'll keep talking about. And uh, we're gaining on it, Olga. Uh, we won't get to everybody, but we are gaining. And we're gaining because people like you are, are helping us share the word. And we really appreciate you. Thank you, sir. Real quickly, as for LISD, congratulations on the opening of the schools. But also, I would like to maybe uh, letting y'all know the fortunate for some of those people that actually take the decision of going virtually. Maybe it's not only the COVID. Some of these people have transportation lack of in different areas. And I would encourage for the, the school districts in the different areas to take that to consideration once we are past this COVID. And if the opportunity is able for it to be available for those students that do request it and have a justifiable uh, reason, I would encourage that to be, you know, considered. Thank you for your time and God bless you. Thanks, Olga. Thank you, Olga. Now we have Yahida Hernandez with Telemundo. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. So my question, it's more based on the testing. There has been around 80,000 tests done in Lubbock and with the expand of COVID-19 testing in the Patterson Library, do you think areas in the north and east of Lubbock are getting as many tests as other areas? 
Yeah, I'll take that one. I'd say yes, uh, unequivocally yes. Um, our uh, our large city-based uh, drive-through test or walk-up drive-up testing location is in North Lubbock. It's at the uh, Rogers Park Gymnasium, which is in the uh, 3200 block of Auburn, I believe. So two blocks west of, excuse me, east of Indiana on Auburn. Uh, and that will be there for the foreseeable future. We also are in a partnership uh, with the Combest Health Center uh, on, e on 40th Street, which is shares sort of the same piece of property with Hodges Elementary. Um, and uh, uh, so I'd, I'd say the answer is, is yes to your question. It's something that we're very much uh, aware of. There's also a seven day a week testing location at uh, the Walgreens at 6th and Q. You also can get tested at three CVSs in town. You can get tested at uh, the Q Lubbock Community Health Clinic. Uh, there are many, many locations to be tested. If you're a tech student or faculty member, you can get tested just north of the museum. If you're a health science center student or faculty member, there's a drive-through clinic at the health science center. Um, uh, we have, uh, I, I think testing is abundantly available. Awesome. Thank you. And my other question is, um, there has been also more than a little more than 80 deaths due to COVID-19 in Lubbock. What do you think are the similarities between most of these deaths? Is it age, uh, underlying conditions? Uh, I'll make a couple of comments and then let Ms. Wells comment. Um, I think we've had 89 deaths. I believe that's right. Um, I don't believe we've had uh, anyone younger than 50 pass away. So certainly uh, it has impacted the older part of our population more. Being a person that fits in that dem demographic, that concerns me. Uh, I also think that we most often find that that the uh, person that's people that have been most impacted by this have underlying health conditions. Right. Catherine, you want to add to that? Um, yeah, I mean, we have seen a lot of deaths um, here in Lubbock. Unfortunately, we saw a lot um, early on with some of those nursing home outbreaks, which were definitely heartbreaking. Um, you know, a lot of individuals do have an underlying condition, um, but them getting a COVID at this time contributed um, significantly to that death. That individual should not have um, died. It was um, COVID that contributed to that. And um, our staff take, you know, every time we get to know these individuals as we're following them. And every time someone um, passes from COVID, it's, um, it's devastating. It's devastating for that family, for the community, um, really hard on staff. Um, you know, we want to prevent as many of those as possible. Awesome. Thank you so much. Ms. Hernandez, let me just reiterate that some of those deaths are not, uh, some of the individuals had no known uh, other conditions that may have uh, yeah. hastened their death. Some of them were otherwise normal people. So mm -hmm. all the reason, again, to make sure we do social distancing, wearing our facial covering, uh, and washing our hands, and as, as our fine mayor says, using our head, to make sure that we, you know, we, none of us know how we're gonna respond to this virus. None of us know. And so it can certainly take the life of an otherwise normal individual. So we still should not take this lightly. Thank you, I appreciate it, Dr. Cook. Okay. And today representing KCBD, we have Benji Sneed. There we go. Good afternoon. I hope y'all can hear me. Um, we're glad we're, and, we're glad you got it off mute there. We didn't know if you were going. We didn't know if you were going to be able to do that. <laughs> well, Karen's on vacation, so you got the the B team this week. But um, th thank you for having me. And uh, first of all, uh, to Dr. Rolo and Dr. McCord as a parent and LISD, thank you so much for the preparation you put into this uh, year. I know it's a much different circumstances. We know it's not a, an easy job. It's not one you necessarily signed up for, but Kathy, I think you told me uh, that you signed up to take care of kids and uh, we appreciate all, all your efforts there. My question is for the two of you, um, maybe more uh, news you can use sort of thing. 
Uh, is there a protocol students should follow for cleaning their masks, uh, whether it's the ones they have, or um, how often should they replace the disposable ones? So Benji, thank you first. Thank you for your kind words. I truly appreciate that. Um, as far as cleaning masks, I think parents, if you would just help us by looking at that mask and seeing if it, if it looks like it needs to be cleaned. Um, I know I am washing mine um, out by hand every evening and hanging it up to dry. So um, I, I think at least every other day, every three days, but um, more frequently if you have a child who tends to get things dirty as, as my three sons would have. Um, as far as the disposable ones, um, we do have a supply of those that we are um, giving students if they don't decide to wear their own. And we also have some cloth masks that we, are, we have distributed to students. Um, as far as the disposable ones, I'm gonna ask Dr. Cook to weigh in on that. How often do you think those need to be switched out, Dr. Cook? We know the, the disposable ones are essentially just that. You know, we can't see all the time. We can see overt gross uh, contamination, that they're dirty, they have stuff on the inside, uh, that sort of stuff. But what we can't see, we can't see virus particles and we can't see other stuff that they filter out. So a disposable mask essentially is, is a one-time use disposable product. Uh, our cloth masks, uh, that are washable, I would, I would certainly recommend washing them daily, especially in a, in a close environment where you're around a lot of people, that sort of thing. Uh, if, if you have the opportunity, I would wash it uh, certainly uh, every three days, every two days, but if, if at all possible, every day, if you've got at least a couple of masks to have. So, and like you said, take it home, wash it by hand, let it dry, pick up the other one that's give it 24 hours to make sure that's dried well. Thank you. Dr. McCord, did you have anything to add? I would just say, you know, Benji, I was just thinking about what we probably could do just in the means of communicating with parents is I know that the CDC has information on their website about the washing of cloth masks. And so mm -hmm. it'd probably be helpful if we added that to our websites and and also just as an education piece for our for our students. I know that we have gone over with our face-to-face -face kiddos um, just a, a safety video and just reminders about social media, social media, social distancing and social media. We talk about that too. And um, then maybe just add that into our education piece um, of, you know, kind of when to wash the mask, how often, and then how to wash it. Um, on the CDC uh, website, I think it talks about, you know, hot water, kind of specifics about the washing. Very good, thank you all. Thanks, Benji. Benji. Okay, and now we have Casey Ellingson representing Texas Tech Public Media. Hi, um, my question is for the school districts, um, how were, if and how teachers were involved in the back to school planning process? I can share that. We actually had um, our teacher organizations um, that are present in Lubbock ISD. We had their leadership um, members, actually part of our design teams that worked over the summer. And then we meet at least once a month with that group of folks to get feedback and make adjustments. So they actually were very much involved in our planning. And, and I would say, um, Casey, for, for friendship, um, what we did is just um, we divided kind of the different aspects of reopening into task force, basically, if you will. And we tried to um, include a campus level person or someone who had expertise in that particular uh, aspect of reopening in our, um, as we created that document. And then what we did, um, and I, I know the other school districts, I know Lubbock and Lubbock Cooper did the same, is before we, um, before school started, I know we got kind of a focus group together of parents and grandparents um, that we kind of asked if they would have anything to add. Um, and then our teachers, um, we <clears throat> have just, we had a few that were kind of spokespeople on the, on the committee as we created the written guidelines. But I know this is true of 
all the districts around is that that's a thousand conversations and it happens every day because we're making those little adjustments here and there. And there are things that teachers are going to think of that, that I'm just not going to think of because they're the experts in that area. But that's a great question. And um, my last question is now that students are back in the classroom um, and in the cafeteria, I am curious how feasible is social distancing now that you're actually seeing bodies in the classrooms? Casey, I actually had the opportunity to see that firsthand. So we are keeping our, our cafeteria capacities at 50%. Um, students are sitting facing one direction, so they're not sitting across from each other. And then we have put spacing in between the students. Um, we are also eating in other places besides just the cafeteria so that we can spread out. And Casey, I would just say similarly for friendship. Um, we have um, added a, a lunch period on some campuses, you know, it just depends on the enrollment at that campus, but also spacing out and then also, and also utilizing other spaces. Um, uh, at our high school and our ninth grade center, uh, which would be our largest campuses where we had, you know, it was the probably the most, one of the most complex challenges. Uh, thank, thankfully, we had done some uh, renovating a couple of years ago and we have a couple of common areas is what they call them where kind of the kids hang out it, it's adjacent to the cafeteria but we're allowing some flexibility that we haven't allowed in the past of kids being able to eat in spaces that aren't necessarily the cafeteria um, we haven't utilized the classrooms for lunches i know that that was kind of discussed along the way, we haven't found the, the need to do that. Um, we've, we've had space, but we're limiting the capacity of the cafeterias and utilizing additional spaces. Great, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. That's all of our time today. I wanna to thank you for, to the superintendents for joining us, Dr. Kathy Rolo and Dr. Michelle McCord. Thank you so much for being here. It was wonderful having your insight here on the panel today. And thank you to our regular panelists and our interpreter. Remember our comprehensive dashboard will be available this afternoon in Spanish. And you can find that at mylubbock.us slash COVID-19. We'll see you all next week. Thanks for having us.